right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the press conference, China and the World, Inside the Dynamics of a Changing Relationship. Uh, I'm joined here uh, by the McKinsey Global Institute and managing partners of McKinsey itself. Um, for those of you that don't know, the McKinsey Global Institute is the economics think tank of McKinsey and Company. Um, and here in Dalian at the annual meeting of the new champions, the MGI launched its brand new report, China and the World. The report explores shifts in, a relative, exp in relative exposure of China to the rest of the world and vice versa. Um, it stimulates the value that could be at stake for more or less engagement between China and the rest of the world all the way up to 2040. So specifically, the report identifies 20 sectors and 73 economies. And so that's a lot, mostly focused on the technology and uh, consumer, uh, the consumer areas. So we're gonna be discussing here with Joe Nye, who's the managing partner of McKinsey Greater China. We're gonna start off with him to give us a bit more about the background and the context to this report. So Joe, I'm gonna pass it over Great. to you first. Great, thank you. Um, well, it's uh, our pleasure to be presenting this very thick report. Um, McKinsey Global Institute specializes in very thick reports. And that's why you know, we're here to explain to you how to read this in 10 minutes or less. Um, but uh, um, this topic is something that has been a very increasing um, subject between um, whether it is you know, policymakers, whether it's our clients, um, and uh, this is really something where over the past, I think, year uh, and a little bit, right, we've actually you know, spent a lot of time looking at data, looking at different ways to look at the picture. We actually are coming up with a few metrics that you may not have seen before, right? So that would need some explaining, but I think that it makes for a very good kind of a, a, a thought piece that we can, we can discuss. Um, and for the purpose of us here, we'll also switch to Chinese. Okay, so this is the last <laughs> word in English before we actually switch to Chinese, but Jonathan Wetzel and Zhou Ming will basically present this, right? And what we'll do after 10 minutes is that we'll try to have a um, Q&A and then we'll talk a little bit around, um, and we'll debate a little bit around the implications of what we are discovered here. So um, Jonathan is a veteran of China and of the Kinsey Global Institute, um, and um, he will kick us off. Thank you, thank you very much, Joe. Also, veteran of WEF, so <laughs> thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I will talk about China and the world. This has been going on for half a uh, one and a half a year. From our perspective, I think this is a hot topic. From the middle and long term, we can s see uh, the relations. Uh, uh, this is China and the world. This is not for the short term. It is for the middle and long term perspective. So that is this basic concept. Why we should we talk about China and the world? The report we are talking about today has four aspects. First of all, we have to consider the relationship between China and the world. Uh, we will look at the economy. Is Chinese economy is more integrated with the global economy? And if yes, uh, which aspect is more important for China uh, and vice versa? So we look at this uh, uh, interplay between China and the world. In general, we can see China has accumulated a certain scale of economy. They are impacting each other. But uh, China's power is not up to a certain level. This is the first concept. Number two is about trends. What are the dynamics of the trends? We start to see some clear changes. On the one hand, if you look at the global picture, uh, you can see China is getting bigger and bigger in terms of economy, in terms of impacts. Uh, from our side, we see an increasingly important China. And from the perspective of China, we can see China has a certain relationship with the world to some extent. 
we can see trade, technology, capital, etc. cross borders between China and the world. If you look at the development of China, the national economy of China is getting bigger and bigger, and the domestic market in China is accordingly getting bigger and bigger, and the supply chain in China is growing in prowess. And of course, China is developing very quickly, and that means uh, it's very important for China. It's China for China and China integration. That's the key. Uh, this is very interesting trend. There are two perspectives to see such an integration. Uh, of course, there are different perspectives. Number two. Number three, we need to think about the future directions. When you talk about the future, how should China and the world engage for better values? And to what extent? So we need to look at the coupling effect of China and the world. Uh, what are the values implicated? So from our perspective, we can see there are five uh, dimensions. Uh, my colleagues can talk about more about that. The core concept is that by 2040, uh, this will be 2.2 trillion. Uh, that's 26 percent of the GDP. Uh, that's the proportion of the Chinese economy in the global economy. Uh, so this is a very important topic. It's not good or bad. It's an important thing to know. We are uh, keen to know that. So this is uh, number three. Number four, we're a consulting firm. And we'll look at the implications to the enterprises. And we look at the strategies of different companies. What are their platforms, their R&D, and their supply chain, and, and are they impacted by these dynamics? Of course, there are uncertainties. And how to consider such uncertainties so that companies, uh, corporations, can find new directions uh, despite the uncertainties? Now, my colleague, you can use your better English, Chinese to give a better explanation. Ms. Song is a senior fellow at McKinsey Global Institute, sorry for that, and also the lead author of the report. Yes, thank you. So you have this in your handouts. Mr. Watson talk about the details, and this is in page two. Let me elaborate them more from page four to page 13 you could see the first aspect. This is about the size of the Chinese economy. It is big. And if you look at the integration potential between China and the world, there is further potential. If you look at page four, you can see there are eight dimensions. With the eight dimensions, we are looking at the degree of globalization and extent of uh, integration. From page five, We'll use different dimensions to go to the details. On the left, on the left of each slide, we are talking about the size of the Chinese economy. It is of high scale. On the right, you can see there is more potential for integration from page five. You can see on the left, you can see China has become the biggest trader of commodities. But if you look at the right, the service trade from China takes a small proportion. It's only half of the goods traded. But if you look at the future directions, service trade will grow at a higher speed than commodities. Page six on the left, you could see that China has 116 companies among the top 500. But uh, they only take about, uh, you can see 20% of their revenue or less came from overseas. So there is a huge potential for going global. Number seven is about the capital market in China. 
If you look at the capital market in China in terms of capitalization, you can see it ranks among the top three. However, if you look at the overseas participation, it's quite limited. I would say it's less than 6%. Page 8, if you look at the outbound tourism, this is number one in the world uh, in terms of tourism or overseas students coming from China. But inbound uh, travelers, it's only 3 or 4% of the global total. So there's further potential. Page 9 is about technology. China has become the number two in R&D, second to the US only. But if you look at the IP imports in China, uh, this is uh, outperforming the export about sixfold. Let's look at page 10. China has built the largest digital economy. And there are over 800 netizens, 800 million netizens in China. But if you look at the cross-border data transfer, this is only 20% of that of US. And it's even lower than that of Singapore. If you look at the cross-border data flow, there is for this potential in China. Let's look at page 12. On the left, you could see for the renewable energy sector, China invests heavily. This is about 45 of the total in the world. But if you look at the right side, the carbon emission from China is 28% of the global's total. China is trying to solve the domestic issues. So China could contribute more in cutting emissions. Page 14 is about culture. Uh, the investment in culture on the left side is high, but in terms of cultural exports and the influence, China is lagging behind. So there is further gap to improve. So I've uh, elaborated point one from Mr. Wassel. China has a huge economy in terms of size, but in terms of integration, there is further space to go. So this is uh, point number one. Let's look at this picture in this way. Let's look at 10 year or 20 year time frame. If you look at the integration between China and the world, this is only getting started. But if you look at it from a longer perspective, you could see this is a small uh, blip. Uh, you, let's talk about the human uh, travelers, uh, capital, etc. It's in a preliminary stage. In McKinsey, we have a longer perspective. If you look at the short term ups and downs, that is not bearing implications for the long term because this is only getting started. So this is point number one. Okay, yes, it's getting started only. Point number two, China versus the world. What's the relationship and what is changing? We've talked about eight dimensions, and we've singled out three dimensions to have a deeper analysis. Uh, we analyzed the dependence of China on the world and vice versa, and we found some uh, uh, changes. These are relative changes. Generally speaking, China is globalizing. But comparatively speaking, in page 15, we found that the world's dependence on China is growing. However, the flip side, the dependence of China on the world is declining in the last decade. But this is not really representing deglobalization in China. This shows us that China has its resources from China. 70% of the GDP growth come from China's own consumption. As Mr. Wassel mentioned, the domestic supply chain in China is more advanced. Let's use the computer industry as an example. Ten years ago, among the computers made in China, 55 were exported. But now, 28% are exported. So more goods are made in China and consumed in China. So that's the dependence change. So this is point number two. 
specifically, uh, this tells us that the domestic uh, consumers are gaining traction. That means what we make here are consumed here in China. So there are less dependence on exports. You see, uh, the exports is getting less and less because China has a huge market. Of course, China will import uh, more. So that's comparatively speaking. So I have lower dependence on foreign markets. I need their materials, but the consumption is at home in China. This is quite normal. If you look at the specific figures, you can see in the last several years, there are obvious, obvious changes. That's because the market growth is leading to such a trend. Indeed, point number three, let's look forward. China versus the world, what the changes will bring uh, in the future? Let's look at page 20. We summarize five different areas, and we believe there would be huge economic values, or these are the values that can be potentially lost. So if we look at these connections, these are up to the choice made by China and the world. For example, the first is about trade, whether China can become a global importer with more open up, and whether the world can have more inclusive trade platforms. Second, whether there could be a liberalization of services, the productivity of service sector in China is lower than that of OECD by 20 to 50 percent whether we can open up, foster competition, and improve the service industry and service sector in China. And the third area is about the globalization and modernization of the financial market. With these changes, China's financial market can better allocate the assets of the household and better allocate the domestic resources. The fourth areas of engagement is collaboration on global public goods like climate change or infrastructure. We believe every year we would have about 35 billion US dollars worth of gap for infrastructure. If China have better connection with the world, we believe there will be some changes in terms of these values. The fifth area is the flows of technology and innovation in a two-way dimension. That is something we can improve the whole factor productive rate in China. Among the five areas, we believe China and world can deepen our cooperation and, stre and strengthen our engagement for more positive values. Or there's another option, we can reduce the connection and liquidity. In that case, these values could be potentially lost. By 2040, according to our estimation, about 22 trillion to 37 trillion US dollar worth of economic value could be at stake from less or more engagement between China and the world which is about 15 to 26 percent of the global GDP by 2040. And the fourth point, all of these changes happen between China and the world means more uncertainties, more changes, more disruptions from the business sector in order to face such changes. Upon page 29, we need to consider what would brought to this business by the changing relationship between China and the world, and how can they improve their operational efficiency and capacity of risk management? This will generate more M&A opportunities.
You guys, there's so much in this report, you could probably talk about it. I'm sure you've been talking about it all day with everybody. Um, but I know we have a lot of people in the audience here from many different news outlets. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. So if you do have a question, just raise your hand and my colleague will come around with a microphone. Who would like to go first? If not, I'm gonna ask a question because there are just so many different things to talk about. Right there. Hello, allow me to use Chinese to propose a question. I see in your second conclusion about the exposure or dependency between China and the world. Do you mean that other than the bigger and opener consumption market, China's economy is having more influence in the world, or you can say our economy is getting more mature, so we have less dependency on foreign market. Following that logic, does that mean countries like US and Japan, they actually have reducing dependency on the foreign market? That is the question, thank you. Yes. As you mentioned, there is an increase in the consumption market and the economy is getting more mature. If you look at other developed countries, with their skill increased, with their supply chain localized, they would have less dependency on other markets. Yet for China, these phenomena are more obvious because upon many categories, China already is world number one or number two producer compared to other developed countries. So these changing trends would be more obvious with China. At the same time, China is the world factory. Localization of the supply chain in China is also quite obvious. And I would like to mention that in the past, I would say 42% 47% of China's exports happened locally. 10 years ago, that was 32%, increased by 5 percentage points. So comparatively, if you see other exporting countries, they can be more than 37 of local values, more than 40%. So you can see in the past, China's domestic value added is a little bit low. After past decades of reform opened up, we have successfully improved our added value. Maybe not as good as other developed countries, but it's a natural process. But something else I would like to mention, that does not mean Chinese consumers no longer like foreign products. It's not that they're localizing their consumption. We analysis 10 different categories, according to the report. There are 10 different categories for consumption. If we choose 30 brands in these categories to see if they're local brands or foreign brands, we see foreign brands account for 46%. If you go to the United States, you go to the similar categories to see their top 30 brands, you would say their top 30 brands are much less globalized compared to China. So Chinese consumers do not change their behavior of buying internationally. It is just that many of the products are manufactured locally in China, and we consume it locally in China. But this brand is still international. So we do not reduce our share in the international market. If you look at the overall big market like US or Japan, the China consumption market still have a higher ratio of demand of foreign product. Please do not miss the understanding that this is a localized market. It is just like we manufacture here in China and we consume in China. It's happened the same place. Sorry, allow me to correct. It should be 40%, that was a wrong figure, should be 40% of local consumption. Please go ahead. 
Thank you. My name is Keiko Yoshioka from the Asahi Shimbun Japanese newspaper. I was a former correspondent in Beijing. So, uh, everyone speaks Chinese, so maybe I can ask a question in Chinese. Thank you. My question is in the financial sector. As you may know, this day in Hong Kong, We think the service sector is not as open as manufacturing sector. So in Hong Kong, for the international finance centers, Hong Kong as international finance center, they still play the major role. Right now, Hong Kong and mainland have a certain competitive relationship in terms of uh, finance. What? Would that impact the overall Chinese capital or financial market? And when do you think Shanghai will over us over overpass Hong Kong as a financial center? I would say Hong Kong's financial market would play a helpful role in open up the mainland financial market. There are many Chinese mainland companies that go public in Hong Kong or they go listed simultaneously with A share and H share with the connection of Hong Kong Shanghai stock market and through the capital market there are many pilots and many trials for Hong Kong I would say it is a great advantage for mainland or for China it is an important part of the overall Chinese financial market. We also heard in the morning from the areas of securities or other financial sectors will gradually open up. I think that would be a very good sort cycle. Hong Kong's financial market had been operating for many years in another system, and mainland China is also developing their own market. So in the past, I would say that opening up is good for the two sides. But for each of the market, they need to come up with their own competitive edge. But overall, more options, a little bit different game rules, different investors, different appetite or market, it's good for the capital market on both sides. If you look at the coming decade on the two sides, you will see uh, very benign cycle of development. I think it's a good thing. In Hong Kong, there is a greater Bay Area, and uh, this is different from Shanghai. They have their own individuality, and they have different uh, focuses. Secondly, in the report, we mentioned that the capital market of China has low degree of global participation. China is opening up the capital market gradually, and this is the right direction. But there are some local pace for such a growth. For bond and securities, uh, gradual internationalization is a good thing. It's important for the capital market. We joined MCI years ago. And that's uh, good to raise attention to the listed companies in Asia in Shanghai. So it's only getting started. As I mentioned earlier, progress in capital market will be bigger. We have some estimates. If you look at the opening up in the financial market, the growth contribution to GDP is uh, 5 to 8 trillion RMB. Yes, we made it clear in the report. About at minute 29, so we can have time for one more quick question. We have the woman in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Yu Ting with National Business Daily. Yeah, I'm so impressed by your lettering. Yeah, so should I speak Mandarin or English? 
Okay. Either way. <laughs> okay, and I have a more a macro question. It's about we are because of the same uh, like globalization 4.0, and meanwhile we see more and more anti-globalization for not for dominance worldwide. So, what would you make of it, and what impact will these moves have on the global economy? Thank you. 当然 ，MGI and McKinsey Global Institute has a long program of research on global flows, so, and I think that you know, gives uh, gives you the context, and it's all available. The we believe, and of course, the research has shown that overall, that uh, being in the flow, being connected, helps to grow. And then being in the flow means you have more access to technology, to uh, capital, to ideas, to people. Uh, and it help, and we've shown and we've seen that cities, regions, countries that are more in the flow um, grow faster and have higher standards of living as a result. But that said, uh, being in the flow doesn't mean everybody always benefits all the time from everything. <laughs> that there are winners and there are people who are left behind, and parts of the countries and parts of places which are left behind. And I think those are some of the issues we've also looked at now related to our work on inequality. And so we see these things as being perhaps two sides of the same phenomenon. <laughs> that as the world becomes more connected, it can and will grow faster, but it also can and will result in greater levels of inequality. Uh, and every country and every region needs to address those for itself and collectively together. For example, here, at the World Economic Forum. Um, so the, the answer to your question is yes. Um, there clearly are concerns about the pace and the uh, ex uh, extent of globalization. But in many ways, that uh, there is no alternative. That this is the only path for developing our potential uh, collectively. And we just have to do the best that we can to make that a, make that a good path. To, to make sure that everybody gets to participate in it. So inclusive globalization, if you will. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And, and finally, a very big thanks to, mm -hmm. to Joe, Jonathan, and Joe Meng. Thank you for everything. I think we all can read. It's a very dynamic report. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of us are looking forward to, a lot of the, the journalists in the audience are looking forward to reading more. So thank you very much Great. for your time. Thank you, thank thank you. you for everybody. Thanks.